This is HighIntensityBusiness.com with Lawrence Neal, helping you achieve your health and fitness goals. Become a great personal trainer and build your high-intensity strength training business. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly. And I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all of the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and get $500 off install when you place an order, please go to arxfit.com and mention HIB, that's High Intensity Business, in the How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $500 off install when you place an order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter HIB in the How Did You Hear About Us field. Lawrence Snell here and welcome back to highintensitybusiness.com, formerly Corporate Warrior. Today's guest is Inform Fitness founder, Adam Zickerman. Adam is the founder of Inform Fitness Studios and author of the New York Times bestseller, Power of 10, the once a week slow motion fitness revolution upon which the company program and philosophy is based. Having started his first gym in a 300 square foot basement in 1997, Adam now spends his time researching, writing, and overseeing seven locations, all while remaining active as a personal trainer. Adam holds an undergraduate degree in biochemistry from Binghamton University and was certified in 1995 as a personal trainer with the American College of Sports Medicine. He studied under Ken Hutchins, the architect of slow cadence strength training for his level one and two and master super slow certifications. Self-taught in equipment design, biomechanics and exercise physiology, Adam has written a comprehensive trainer certification course for qualified applicants on the principles of high intensity training and the power of 10 methodology. He is also host of the Inform Fitness podcast, which is a, a bi-monthly podcast, which I've been enjoying immensely and stealing tactics from. Adam, <laughs> welcome to the show. Sorry, I didn't mean to laugh <laughs> in the middle of your introduction. <laughs> no, that's fine. I don't mind. I don't mind a little bit of a response as I read out the, the <laughs> intro. Um, great to talk to you again. Great to see you at the conference recently, at, at REC. How are you doing? Mm-hmm. I'm doing well, thank you. Uh, still thinking about that REC, actually. There's some good stuff going on there. What were the main highlights for you? Well, I just loved listening to James Fisher and, and uh, Jeremy Lenecki, uh, Leonecki, uh, just to be able to talk and to listen to objective you know, it's it's hard to find objective voices in this field. So it's very refreshing just to hear somebody that's just in it to in it for the truth or seeking the truth at least. I don't know if we'll ever find the truth, but uh, at least trying. And uh, it was really uh, it was great to you know to just smash paradigms and thoughts, especially when it came to like understanding that muscle. Like when we we talked to uh, when Jeremy talked. Dr. Lenecki talked about how there is a very weak correlation between muscle hypertrophy and and muscle strength. That was kind of mind-blowing. Well, just on that, I mean, I got to be honest with you. I attempted to to understand that better in a discussion I had with uh, Tom Toombs and Craig Huber, who were also at the conference. And uh, we we didn't get very far in, in terms of trying to understand his presentation. But what was the key takeaway for you? Was it just that Muscle hypertrophy and strength don't seem to correlate as much as we think, or is there more to it than that for you? 
Well, yeah, that's a big one right there. I mean, I mean, obviously, uh, studies, you know, I did a, I, I actually did an episode on studies, you know, uh, with, uh, Dr. Peter Atia. That was great. And, uh, and as you know, then, you know, it, it, you know, you have to take these studies with a grain of salt and did, did it necessarily change anything? I mean, only, only to be open minded, if anything, if nothing else, just to like say, wow, you know, I mean, let's face it, we all got into strength training. Well, at least I did. And I know most people I know that are in this game, we got into it because we want, we want to get bigger and stronger simultaneously. And now, and what, you know, what's really interesting is like, I'm actually not a very big guy muscularly, you know, but I'm very strong. And he was talking about that innate strength is what led to a uh, longer lifespan, uh, all cause mortality. Uh, and, uh, and you're talking about that innate strength. It's not even necessarily people that worked out with weights that live longer. It was actually just people that were strong live longer. <laughs> you know, so so I'm like, uh, and you know, I started thinking about it, and, and at first it was kind of like a pouring, you know, cold water over me. Uh, it was kind of shocking, but then I then I thought about it. I realized I think about this a lot without even realizing I think about, it. and that is a lot of people that you know they get a lot stronger and more. I'm very strong, but I, you know, I'm not that big, and I and my strength belies my size. Quite honestly, I definitely am stronger than I look. You know, and uh, turns out I have a lot of clients like that. You know, so I've almost been kind of ignoring that. And then when he brought it up, I was like, Oh yeah, you know. I mean, this is like a day later. I'm like, Oh yeah. I mean, hypertrophy and strength. Is right under my nose the fact that you know you can get stronger and not necessarily get bigger. And then of course you got to think about the neurological adaptations and what is causing the strength and what are the mechanisms for strength if it's not hypertrophy, and it starts getting kind of interesting. But that's where the research is is going, and we're hopefully we'll find this out one day. But in any case, I guess the takeaway for my clients because I'm always thinking about what well what am I going to tell my clients about this? Well, one thing is to maybe reassure people that aren't necessarily getting bigger, you know that they are getting stronger and that that's possible that it is actually possible to be getting stronger this is not our imagination you are truly getting stronger uh even though you're not breaking out of your shirts you're actually still getting stronger and that especially when you talk about strength and how that's that's the key to good health right strength not so much about muscle size uh, uh matter of fact uh hold on a second i i have uh Lene- Lenecki's paper here and uh in the introduction to his paper, he talked about muscle size. There's some quotes about muscle size in the past. I think I highlighted it. Uh, if you bear with me for a second. Uh, Have you moved the camera deliberately to show us the paper? No, I moved that by accident reaching for my paper. <laughs> right. oh, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, hold on a second. Uh, it's a nice really pair cool. of white jeans you've got there, Adam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay. All right. So I'm going to read this. In 1963, 1976, it was written by Morehouse and Miller that it has not been proved that hypertrophy is necessarily a desirable reaction. Some students are of the opinion that it may be simply a byproduct of training, perhaps a noxious one. I love that. What does that mean, a noxious one? Noxious, like like not good. Undesired. Poison, undesirable. Right. Or something that's noxious is uh, is not desirable, you know. How it's, funny! It's, so How funny. you know, this has been so. This is not old, new thinking per se. You know, the idea that you know getting too big. You know, obviously, in ev- evolutionarily speaking, muscle is m- metabolically very demanding. So if you're living in a you know feast and famine type of situations, having more muscle mass is only a detriment. You, you have to feed all that muscle. So, you know, uh, in that case, uh, we've always known muscle to be a little bit too much baggage. Mm-hmm. And I always think about the, the – uh, I was a kid at the time, but in the 70s when they had the gas crunch, all of a sudden, you know, those big engine cars, those muscle cars, uh, all of a sudden were left behind for the uh, the Honda Civics and the, and the Japanese gas-efficient cars because gas was so expensive and rare. 
So, you know, I, it just made me think of, you know, these huge guys when all of a sudden food is scarce and expensive. They're like, oh, shit, I got to feed all this muscle now. And it's not as easy to downsize <laughs> muscle as it is maybe just buying a new car. <laughs> anyway, uh, so it's, it's, it's always been an analogy for me in my brain because I lived, you know, I remember being a kid in the backseat of my parents' car waiting for an hour for gas. It was kind of crazy back back in the early 70s during that gas crunch. Anyway. So muscle is expensive, right? And uh, and like I said, could be noxious. So the idea, going back to my clients and, and and muscle hypertrophy being correlated or not correlated with muscle strength, uh, is uh, that's my takeaway. Just like telling my clients, don't worry about it. You're getting stronger, and that's the important thing. Strength is associated with with a long life, healthy life, um, not so much your your muscle hypertrophy. Yeah, and then and then Doug's presentation went on to talk about how negatively regulated hypertrophy is, just to really hammer home that point. Exactly, you know, myostatin and things like that, all the things that kind of govern our, our body's ability to build muscle. It's obviously some kind of feedback loop going on to protect us from being too strong, too big, you know, for probably ob- for the same reasons we talked about. You know, evolutionarily speaking, it's probably more of an advantage not to be too muscular yet strong. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. The strongest yeah. guys I know, some of the strongest guys I know are, <clears throat> you know, weigh 140 pounds. I mean, these, I used to rock climb on a regular basis. And if you ever saw rock climbers, man, you know, they, they, they're just all sinew and muscle and strength, you know, but not necessarily huge, you know, in, in size. And boy, oh boy, you know, if you ever tried rock climbing, especially some challenging stuff, um, I know it's a lot of technique, but you got to be damn strong. <laughs> no, absolutely. I was going to ask you, um, in terms of your your clientele, have you had someone come in who um, looks very deconditioned, doesn't look strong at all, um, doesn't have much muscle mass, so all of the above, and is able to just demonstrate tremendous strength immediately? Have you seen that? Yeah. I mean, big, overweight people tend to be also very strong. I have a uh, cousin uh, who, who who's an MD out in, out in uh, at Stanford University out in California. And I remember years ago he told me that um, a lot of patients that he sees obese patients happen to have a lot of muscle mass as well. And I was like, what? You know, the, all these what I thought were deconditioned people being so overweight. Turns out you have to have a certain amount of strength just to carry all that weight. You know, that's what his uh, analysis was. Well, yeah, they got to be strong, Adam. I mean, look how much weight they're carrying. So I was like, yeah, well, that's a good point, actually. And so anyway, I paid attention to that more as I worked with, you know, when I work with somebody that apparently is deconditioned and overweight, um, and then they turn out to be very strong. Now, as far as the weight loss is concerned, that, that that's always a big challenge, getting people to lose the weight. And as uh, I'm learning talk about research i mean fat metabolism is you know as complex as ever you know and it's getting it's getting even more complex as we learn more so who the hell knows about fat loss and what the best way to do that is that's right i mean i've really grown to appreciate how or why a lot of high intensity personal trainers will just stick with the strength training part and not become or try and become a nutritionist because you know the more you get into either of these things the more you realize you don't know or we don't know. Uh, and it can become very challenging to uh, become very adept at both fields. Um, one thing I just wanted to challenge you on is something you said earlier, which interested me, is um, you were talking about how people that are very over fat um, you know, need muscle mass and strength in order to carry that around. I actually thought it was the inverse because I remember Dr. Doug McGuff saying that he suspected uh, someone who was very over fat to have... Um, the same, the same, uh, you know, uh, a large amount of muscle mass. Um, and he referred to the, and I don't know if you remember him saying this, cause I know you've probably listened to a lot of what he said. Um, he said about how, when he actually looked at the abdom- abdominal muscles, they were thin as paper. Um, mm. and what he then went on to say is the mechanism might be something to do with internal starvation slash, actually I, I could be misquoting in there um but some kind of competition for resources between body mm. fat and muscle because if you're too if you have too much body fat then the the obviously the the um 
uh, signaling in the body is preferentially shuttling nutrients to to that um, mm-hmm. rather than muscle tissue. So I thought it was the inverse. So what, what, how do you reconcile that or do you disagree? Oh, I don't know if I disagree. It's a great discussion, right? I mean, I guess off the top of my head, as you say that, um, you know, some, our body uh, wants to preserve muscle almost above all else. So yes, when you're when you when people are obese, right? Um, they aren't starving internally, right? They're not getting the nutrients they need. I mean, that's why you become diabetic and and all and and, and you have the whole you know uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, you know. Insulin oh, resistance, no, insulin resistance, but metabolic. Uh, what, what's the it's metabolic overall? syndrome? Yes, sorry, thank yeah, you. Yes, right. so so the whole the whole metabolic syndrome thing is kicking in, and then people are definitely you know starving internally, not getting the nutrients they need. However, uh, I just can't help but think about how amazing the body is at preserving muscle, the most important thing for movement, right? So even though they're somehow starving, in a sense. Uh, because they're not getting the nutrients they need due, due to you know uh, insulin resistance and so on, uh, the body seems to still figure out how to preserve muscle mass and keep that strong. Uh, and and I, I look at some of the fasting data. Uh, it, it's kind of remarkable, some of the data I've been looking at lately uh, for people that are fasting for doing the seven-day water fast, for example, and they would do a DEXA scan and they didn't see much of a change in muscle mass, a little bit. A little bit, but certainly not as much as you'd think uh, for, for somebody who hasn't eaten in seven days. So, and these are and some of these people that, that I'm talking about were lean to begin with. Uh, so, and and they you'd think leaner people would would definitely lose uh, more muscle mass uh, due to a seven day fast, but they're not. And the discussion on that was about you know well the body once again will go to extraordinary lengths to preserve muscle mass above all else. Uh, so that's what I'm thinking that might be occurring because I have to say, uh, and this is anecdotal, of course, but we do train a lot of people and we do train a lot of people that are overweight. Uh, I would say, you know, classically obese. And uh, again, uh, they're strong. Now, I don't know if that's innate or it's because they're uh, obese or maybe it's in spite of the fact that they're obese. But but I can't deny the fact that I, I tend to Notice that obese people are strong, you know, stronger. Uh, not that they lose strength when they lose weight necessarily either because they're strength training with me if they're losing weight. But uh, they do seem to be strong, stronger than I would expect for somebody that's, you know, grossly overweight. Now, that's super interesting. Uh, I do find I love you know, talking to people like you because you've, especially at the scale of your business, you've trained thousands of people, um, you know, probably tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of sessions. So I do find that kind of anecdotal data quite interesting, uh, very interesting. Um, I wanted to, to move on to talking about um, Dr. Ken Leisner, uh, you know, very, who very sadly passed away uh, not too long ago. I know he was a, obviously a big influence on you and mentor, and you, you shared some really uh, interesting and entertaining stories um, about training with him back in the day. Uh, And, you know, I wanted to just spend some time talking about Ken. You know, I was so gutted because when I spoke to you last time, you said, oh, have you got him on the show or tried? And I said I was trying. And I had actually emailed him, I believe, and and sent a few messages and we never actually scheduled anything. Um, And obviously, you know, I regret that. But so what, so I guess as a way to kind of make it up, uh, I wanted to kind of address him here, talk mm-hmm. about, talk about his story a little bit, um, your experiences with him. And then also just invite everyone listening to this. If you have links to content, for instance, Mike Petrella recently republished this great video where Ken is, um, training, which looks like I believe his garage to some like all sorts of different music. And you can just see how, I mean, you're talking about people that aren't, who are strong, who aren't big. I mean, he was incredibly mm-hmm. strong yeah. for a guy of his size. Uh, and, and, and so I'll, I'll post a link to that video because it's, it's a great watch. Um, but if anyone listening to this, you've got any resources you would like to send to me um, that are about uh, Ken, please email lawrence at highintensitybusiness.com and I'll make sure they're in the post. So, Adam, tell me about some of your fondest memories of Ken. Well, I guess when his heart is probably, you know, the biggest thing that I, which is, 
I just realized, which is like kind of ironic when I talk about his heart, that's what, how he died. He had an aortic split. And, uh, you know, which I find ironic considering how big a heart he had. And, uh, you know, I remember first meeting him. See, you know, he worked with a lot of big guys, a lot of strength guys, like power lifters and, and football players. I mean, he was all about strength and, and muscle, <laughs> muscle hypertrophy and, and uh, working out super duper hard. And I was, you know, I met him, I was in my early to mid 20s and I was into martial arts big time. And that's what prompted me to go see him because I wanted to get stronger from martial arts. And I, I, when I first met him, now he's a chiropractor also, and he had a chiropractic office on his main floor of his house. And then he had his basement gym. And I met him, he brought me into his chiropractic office and we were talking. And the, I, I, I just remember our first meeting so vividly. It's crazy because uh, it's so long ago. Uh, I know I'm, I'm in my fifties now, so <laughs> it's been a while. And, uh, he just took so much time to, to learn about me and r- very quickly, I wasn't intimidated anymore because when I went down to that basement with all those huge, I mean, I was ne- I was always the smallest guy. You know, I talked about my strength, but it belied my, you know, my, you know, I'm a small guy for my strength and he didn't, I thought he was going to judge me on that, you know, because he's so used to working with big, strong guys. And I was like, you sure you want to work out with me? You sure you don't mind if I'm working out here? You know, and uh, he just respected my toughness and the, the fact that I did martial arts and he couldn't care less about my size. He, all he cared about is your desire and, and your, your, your effort, you know, your discipline. He was very big on that. I remember one time now, you know, he, he had a big heart, but he also called you out. I mean, he 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 kind of reminded me a little bit of uh, if you remember uh, the coach for the for the New York Giants, uh, Bill Parcells, and and he he you know he had a way of motivating his people by kind of putting him down a little bit, teasing. Him. But you knew if he did that, he liked you actually. You know, if he put you down, he, he liked you. But I just remember being where I was working out. I was with my trainer, and some guy just finished his workout, and after his workout, he decided before he left to do a set of uh, chin-ups. And uh, Dr. Ken saw that. And he was like, everybody, everybody. And he just quieted the whole place down and got everyone to stop working out. He says, you see this? And he's pointing to the guy doing his chin-ups. And he's like, there's a guy that obviously didn't work out hard enough because how can he finish his workout and still be wanting to do a set of chin-ups? You know? He he really did not respect that at all. I mean, he wanted you to lay it all out there, you know, and he wanted he wanted you to empty the tank by your last repetition. And the fact that he kind of finished his workout and was able to still work out after that kind of really irked him. So he didn't have any problem calling you out like that. And uh, I just said to myself, <laughs> that's like, don't ever, ever slack off in front of this guy, you know, uh, it, there was and you didn't want to. You I mean. You want to, I wanted to impress him always. I always wanted to work as hard as I can for him. And uh, he was very nice to me and uh, made me feel really good about the fact that I was uh, maybe not one of the biggest guys around, but, you know, he, he complimented my strength and my effort, and, and that meant the world to me. But not to mention the fact that I really learned what working out hard was all about. And, and that's kind of the jumping off point for my career. I didn't know it at the time because I wasn't thinking to make a career out of out of what I do now back then. For me, that was at that time, I just want to be the best martial artist I want to, that I can be. I want to be the strongest I can be. And, um, you know, who, who knew that, you know, 20 years later, I'd be kind of utilizing what I learned to and, and, and refining my career based on that experience. It was incredible. I mean, I cried. When I found out he died, I cried. I, I mean... That doesn't usually happen to me. <laughs> right, yeah. So well, I can't see, understand. I watched, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, he had a very important uh, influence on me. My One of my biggest regrets, uh, you know, you talk about regretting not getting in touch with him for getting an interview with him. My, one of my regrets is that I didn't mention him in the acknowledgments of my, my book. I mean, that was a huge oversight. I don't know how the hell I let that happen. Do uh, an he, update. He, yeah, here we go. For everyone, you know, if you read my book, just know that you know Ken Leisner had a lot to do with it. 
No, I'm sure. I'm sure he would understand. And uh, now that was a that was a really awesome story. I uh, appreciate you you sharing that. Now, hopefully, I won't be insensitive asking this, um, but there's this thing in high intensity training where everyone's like everyone who does hit or strength training, I should say, because I know he was well. From what I understand, he wasn't necessarily in the same camp as Ken Hutchins, and you might want to correct me on that. Um, yeah. <laughs> and and. and you know, and everyone wants to think that, you know, no one, everyone's immortal in here. And, you know, we sort of addressed this when we had, um, when I spoke to Anne-Marie Anderson about Greg, because again, how can this happen to someone who does high intensity training and they're healthy? Now, you mentioned he had an aortic split. Mm. Um, was that, do you know if it was genetic or like, are you able to talk about that? We don't have to, if you feel that's insensitive, I really don't mind. Well, I don't know. I mean, that's what I heard was the diagnosis. I have to say, um, I wonder, uh, when I heard what it was, I, I had to wonder it was, if it was from all the Valsalva. I mean, right. uh, we, how I evolved you know, over time with my strength training, uh, one of the big things was just breathing techniques. Uh, and uh, that was never discussed uh, during my life no days. Uh, we worked out really hard. Um, going to muscle failure wasn't enough. You had to go to muscle failure, then you had to go to muscle failure again, and then you had to go to muscle failure again. And we're talking about uh, the same muscle group. And you know, we, you know, one, one routine was uh, what we called fifties. You had to do fifty squats, fifty compound row, and fifty pull down, right? <laughs> and that was the whole workout. But you know, you weren't not allowed out of, it was a hammer strength uh, squat machine, an incredible machine, really brutal. Uh, And, you know, you weren't allowed out until you did your 50th rep. So you can hold your breath, you can do whatever the hell you want, as long as you you just got to get those 50 reps. And, um, you know, carrying anvils and and, and across football fields and, and stuff like that. I mean, you're holding your breath a lot, you know, and, and, uh, the workouts lasted a long time. So I'm thinking this chronic year after year after year. And he was so damn strong and he lifted so heavy. Uh, but the, the, the straining and the holding of the breath, I, I, I wonder, because it was about the rep. It was about finishing those 50 reps. And uh, I don't know. I just wonder if, if his heart just went eventually after just all those years of, of that interthoracic pressure building up and right. just wearing away at the heart. You know, I don't know if you'll ever be able to find that out. Uh, I mean, was he born with it? Man, oh man, I doubt it because I think it would have happened a lot sooner if he was born with that given his lifestyle and the way he worked out. Right. I, I think, I think I don't know. I don't know what the rest of his heart looked like. I don't know about left ventricular hypertrophy or any of that stuff. So, you know, I don't want to diagnose. And uh, But, I mean, if you're asking me to speculate, it's pure speculation. If anything, it did remind me just to make sure that we are doing the right thing when it comes to proper breathing. I mean, uh, that was one of the ways we veered away from each other, um, you know, based on, you know, how I used to work out. I don't know if he evolved because I, I really didn't work out with him or hear about his workouts for the last, you know, 10, 15 years. Yeah. Um, as, and as I said, I will, there's some that, that video that Mike published is, um, extraordinary and it's, it's great motivation for strength training and I'll make sure that's in the post. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, ARX. Are you looking to create a cutting edge, high intensity training facility? Are you confused on what equipment to use or how to separate yourself from the masses? Well, then ARX Fit might be the answer you're looking for. I asked Mike Palano from ARX a few questions about how ARX machines are challenging the status quo of the exercise industry around the globe. Mike, if you could... Give the listeners a quick summary of why ARX is so different from the traditional machines or tools they're used to seeing in most exercise facilities. ARX is totally different than anything you've seen before. This isn't just another weight stack machine. We've looked at the last 40 years of exercise technology and used that knowledge to create something entirely new. ARX uses a new form of resistance, a motor, and we pair that motor with computer software so that we can maximize the safety, effectiveness, and efficiency of your workouts. So you may be asking, okay, but how does ARX compare to weights? 
Traditional machines you see in gyms today are based on lifting metal weights and battling gravity. What people don't realize is that when you're forced to lift a static weight like this, one that doesn't adapt or change while you use it, you're underloading yourself rep after rep. And this unnecessarily limits your ability to make improvements. With ARX, we've taken a totally different approach. We removed weights and gravity from the equation altogether. Instead, ARX combines our patented motorized resistance with our custom computer software to provide you with the world's safest, most effective, and most quantified form of resistance training ever. When you train with ARX, you are training to your perfect level of resistance, both positively and negatively 100% of the time. No more guessing what weight to use, ARX does all of that for you, instantly and automatically. We'll also track and measure every second of every rep, so you can quantify all of your workouts to find out if you're improving and by exactly how much. Whether your goals are bigger muscles, increased strength, stronger bones, or just to look good in a bathing suit, ARX can help you achieve all of these and more, but do so in a fraction of the time it would take compared to traditional equipment. If you're looking for the most efficient, most effective, and most quantified piece of exercise equipment on the market today, then look no further than ARX. Thanks, Mike. That all sounds really impressive. If you'd like to learn more about ARX, visit arxfit.com and mention that you heard about ARX on the High Intensity Business Podcast to receive an exclusive deal of $500 off shipping and installation of your ARX machines. Do you want to give some uh, just, have you got any any kind of, I guess, stories or anecdotes regarding workouts he put you through? You mentioned one there. I'd be interested to hear what other workouts, extreme workouts he yeah, put those, you through. Yeah, the 50s, that, that was a big one. That was, you know, when I came downstairs, again, he did this in his basement. So you walk downstairs, you find out what you're doing. Oh, by the way, speaking of Kenley, he, he was involved in every single workout. He, he pretty much wrote, I mean, he worked hard, man. He really cared about his job. Um he did big write-ups on your uh, on you each person. Uh, he did follow-ups, he did evaluations, and he prepared all the workouts for us. Even though he had a, a whole staff of of trainers, he didn't rely on the trainers to put to get, put the protocols together. He he did it himself. And so he he looked at all my workouts each week and. Um, he put it together and he directed the trainer. So I would go downstairs with the trainer. The trainer would look at my chart and say, "Okay, we're doing 50s today." I'm like, "Oh fuck!" <laughs> but uh, that, that was that was a tough one. You know, I, I think I might have mentioned this on, on last time we spoke, it, which is you know, like you know, if you didn't walk out of Lysner's place puking, you you weren't working out hard enough. And uh, he'd make you walk out of your place with your bag of puke to throw out in the corner. He wouldn't want you to leave your puke on his premises. So. He had to walk through his, his his waiting room, you know. So everyone, when you walk through his waiting room, you know, on your way out, you know, people would make sure and check out to see if you're walking out with your bag of puke, and you know, it's like a badge of honor. It's kind of weird. Uh, cannot be healthy for you, right? I don't recommend working out till you puke. By the way, some of the other things that we evolved. So those are the fifties, and then. Uh, the other, the other thing that I remember so distinctly, and it didn't really matter the exact routine, but he was always mixing in um, like, uh, like intervals uh, between sets. So you do, let's say, leg press. And then he'd have you go on what they call an upper body ergometer, a UBE machine. I don't know if, it's basically a bicycle for your upper body. They were really popular back in the day, and he had one of those. And so you do a set of squats, <clears throat> and then you go right onto the UBE and do like you know a minute as hard as you can on the UBE. You're already breathing heavy from the um, from the squat, but now you're on this UBE, and you and now you're really <clears throat> hyperventilating. Then you go into chest press, and you'd go to a, a set to failure on, on chest press, and then back on the UBE, and then. He'd have you go on a pull down and then back on a UBE. I mean, like, how do you not puke after that? You know, um, those, those were, I'll never forget that. I mean, and you know, we loved it. We loved it. You know, I mean, it's, it, when I look back on it, I don't know if I can get myself to work out like that ever again. I don't know how I did it back then, but uh, he motivated you and he made you feel if you didn't, you know, you were less of somebody, you know. Anyway, so that 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 was 
a signature of his, having you go back and forth between a, a strength training routine and then intervals on either a bicycle or a UBE machine, which is, like I said, an upper body bicycle. But it also sounded like, and you mentioned this, I think, in our first episode together, which, by the way, if listeners want to learn more about Ken, you talk a fair bit about him then as well, and I'll link to that. Um, but one of the things you mentioned is how he had a, a, a appreciation for the importance of the essentials, you know, multi-joint movements, um, mm. you know, one workout, as you mentioned there, would simply be maybe three different types of exercises or, you know, a handful of exercises to address all the muscles. And he wasn't, it didn't sound like he was concerned with much in the way of single joint or smaller exercises, um, which is interesting. It sounds like he was quite ahead of his time in that respect. Yeah, I think so. I mean, Going back to what we were talking about before about the wreck, right? That was what James Fisher was talking about. Right. You know, uh, not seeing much of a difference between single joint movements versus compound movements. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, we did the single joint movements with Lysen, no doubt about it. I mean, he used to have this <clears throat> this bar that was like, I don't know, it seemed like I have big hands, but this bar that we do curls on, I can hardly get my hands around it. You know, you do curls with this really thick bar, you know. So he was big into, you know, the weird kinds of single joint movements as well. Uh, but yes, I mean, I would definitely say that, like I said about those 50s, there was, you know, that's just three exercises um, and all compound movements. And so there's no doubt that he had a fondness for the compound movements and probably favored them as far as overall strengthening was concerned. And he probably felt there was more of a functional aspect to it as well. Yeah. You know, he worked with a lot of, he worked with a lot of athletes, right? So he, he knew if you were going to be on the, if, you know, you're going to be a lineman, you know, on a football team, you know, leg press and, and shoulder press and, and compound row. He got into those, he, he started buying those, uh, ground, I don't know if you heard about these, might be a little bit before your time. Uh, those ground-based hammer strength machines, they, Hammer Strength came out with something called the ground-based line. I don't even know if they still have them. They probably don't. But it was basically a machines that you uh, ran into like a football player to lift weight. It was a crazy concept. And he, he picked up a couple of those things. Uh, I, I avoided that. I, you know, I had back surgery when I was a kid. And uh, so I – said to Dr. Ken that I was going to pass on the ground-based machines. I didn't think flying into a machine with my shoulders lifting weights was a good idea for a guy with my back problems. And he, thank God to his credit, because he probably could have talked me into it <laughs> if he asked me to, but he let it go. He said, yeah. Again, he was a chiropractor and he knew the surgery that I had. So he, he, he was crazy, but I guess not that crazy. <laughs> Yeah, and just on on what you said there about um, single joint versus multi joint, you did a great podcast, which I will plug now because I think it's um, very good uh, with Dr. Fisher on exactly that. Um, mm -hmm. So the listeners and the people watching this can uh, can go over to uh, what's the website for the the podcast? Is it just informfitness.com or is there a yeah, so different website? We have a on the navigation bar. You have a link to it. Plus, it's on iTunes. You know, so if you if you know if you have an if you have if you have a phone that has an icon for podcasts, you can just search for Inform Fitness Podcast and it'll pop up. And how's that going for you? The podcasting. You're doing a great job. Thank you. How's it going? I I, I love it. I mean, I, I did it. I did it because my my mind's geared to. The, the end user, not so much the person that likes to geek out on exercise like us uh, and like like what your podcast is about. Uh, mine is more for like my clients and my clients to share with their friends because their friends don't believe the shit they're doing here. And, you know, it's, it, it's more content and more, more discussions to uh, help them talk to their friends about, you know, sensible evidence-based exercise. So it's been great for me. I, it's been good for my clients, but honestly, you know, I enjoy doing it. It, it gives me the opportunity to, to do more research and to, to keep my, my nose in the books and to talk to some great people. And, and I learn so much doing this. I have to prepare for these things. I, I usually write an outline and I, I'll read the book of the person I'm interviewing. And uh, it, if nobody listened, I'd still be doing it, yeah. you know, but we're doing good. I think we've got couple of thousand downloads per episode at this point which is pretty cool i'm you know i i didn't expect that yet you know 
Yeah, no, it's great. I really enjoy it. I particularly liked your, I liked a bunch of episodes, but I really liked the one with uh, Bill De Simone. I had caught myself bursting out laughing because like <laughs> you were critiquing another individual and he was just so cut. He was like, is that correct? And he'd just say, no, and then give his answer. <laughs> uh, and, and he just gave some great analogies, um, which I can't recall now, but I just encourage the the uh, the listeners to check out that particular episode. Um, but I'm just really curious what, what metrics, if any, have you seen improve in your business? Because I'm always encouraging people to consider a podcast in our industry because it's a, I believe it's a, an effective way to help retain your clientele because you're, it's another method to educate them on what you do, as you were saying there, and on why, uh, what you do is so important for them. So just curious if you've seen it improve things like retention or maybe other metrics in your business or maybe got more people through the door or what have you. Uh, now, now you're, uh, <laughs> you're, you're exposing my weakness now, which is my, I don't really pay attention to that too much, you okay. know? And, uh, yeah. So yeah, the business, now you're talking about the business aspect and the marketing part of all this, you know, business is good. Business is good. We get a lot of referrals. My clients are commenting on the podcast. They like the podcast. They're sharing the podcast. I don't know how to quantify that. I don't know if it's it's keeping. I'm I'm sure it has. I'm sure it has some kind of, you know, effect on my client retention. You know, uh, I know my clients are really enjoying it. They're, they're learning. And I remember when I took a break from it, people were saying, "When's your next one coming out?" I miss it because I took a bit like I took a hiatus uh, recently. Um, so. Yeah, people are like, yeah, I really look forward to those. So I don't know. If, I mean, those people will probably be clients anyway. But I got to tell you, they, they just enjoy the information. And there's so much crap out there and there's so much marketing out there. And uh, if you're listening to these podcasts, you're at least keeping your finger on some of the what I think is more of the evidence-based stuff and not so much just the hype and the, and the marketing. Again, I'm doing this more – you know, to just whoever wants this information, they can have it. And again, for me, it's just fun. You know, it's fun to talk into a microphone and ask these questions and, and, and explore, you know. And uh, like I said, if no one listened and I didn't get any client retention out of it, I, I, I'd still do it. No, I think that's great. I think that the fact that you're thinking about things like retention and referrals as being almost like a, a, a nice byproduct which you didn't really plan for um and that you just enjoy doing this you enjoy the impact it's having on your clients i think that's cool i think that's so so cool so i started the business i mean yeah <laughs> yeah i had nothing's changed in 20 years in that respect uh it's always i always felt just just do the right thing and, and give good information then the business will take care of itself I've tried, you know, listen, I've tried all the marketing stuff. I've tried the advertising. I've tried the local advertising. I mean, we do a lot of community work. I mean, I'm involved in my community, but that's because I just like being involved in my community. Again, the, these are natural, I mean, my business growth are just natural consequences of me being part of my community and wanting to talk to people about this and teach people. And I guess that's, you know, the most authentic way of doing it. I'm, I don't, you know, people criticize all of us, um, people in this weird niche of high intensity training, I think we're always being criticized for, uh, or they, or they kind of point to the fact that nobody's actually franchised this like, like Peloton or, uh, you know, orange theory that it's a reflection on the workout itself. It might be a reflection of the workout itself. Like, you know, <laughs> it's just too hard for the average person to do. I don't know. Or he gets their head around. I'm not sure, or I don't know if it's uh, because we just do a really shitty job marketing it, or both. Uh, but um, I don't think the the fact that we haven't one of us hasn't become the next Orange Theory. I certainly don't think that's a reflection on on the efficacy of the workout, uh, especially when you again when you look at all the research. Uh, I mean, again, depends what we're talking about. I'm not as uh, you know this, this I. Once a week, 20 minutes once a week, super slow. I mean, I think that's probably what a lot of people, because even I wrote the book that talked about it basically like that. Um, but, you know, 
that's not how I look at the overall high intensity exercise industry anymore. I mean, um, you know, there's lots of things that people are doing out there that seem interesting and uh, that seem to work that aren't necessarily doing a 10-10 protocol on super slow cammed equipment, you know, once or twice a week. Uh, and still people are getting in good shape and they're strong. We don't have all the answers. So, uh, and uh, uh, we're certainly not just sticking to that that script, you know. I mean, the framework that we work within is a lot more flexible than you might imagine after reading, let's say, you know, Ken Hutchins or something like that. Yeah. And, uh, no, and I respect that. And, you know, you, you touched on it in our first episode. And in fact, with your informed fitness podcast with Simon Shawcross, who talks about how you do high intensity uh, interval training occasionally with yeah. people and, and stuff like that. You know, one of the things, um, you said to me in our first interview, we, you mentioned, uh, Dr. Richard Feynman, the famous physicist. Um, <laughs> And he says something really interesting that he said, which is, um, you know, he was challenged about, you know, are we in the scientific age now? And he's like, well, not really, because how many people actually think scientifically and think objectively? Um, and I think yeah. it's um, suffice to say that, you know, it's, we're still in a place uh, where, for the most part, people don't think scientifically or objectively when it comes to exercise, um, which is a bit of a shame. But how, tell me, are you optimistic about the future? Do you think that we're trending towards high intensity strength training or something familiar to that um, more and more in society? Or what do you, what do you see happening? Oh boy. I don't know. I mean, I mentioned orange theory, right? I mean, they're still put signs on their windows that talk about how many calories they're burning in an hour and stuff like that. And, you know, they're the newest thing that's, that's taking storm. And, you know, they, by all, by all accounts, it seems like they're a very successful franchise. So if you use that as a snapshot of, of how people are thinking about exercise, I guess we're not that much closer than we were when I brought that up originally about Richard Feynman. But, um, better than aerobics, though, right? Maybe. More well, yeah, movement I mean, towards higher intensity and in terms of true, training. true, yeah. So I think that is happening. <laughs> uh, that it, it is, it's true. You know, so uh, I think we have maybe moved the needle a little bit, maybe a little bit. But the needle's moving. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if it's going to be where I want it to be in my lifetime. You know, but that's why that's that's why I do these podcasts. Exactly. I mean, and that, and that's why people like you. And, and and Dr. Tia now has his podcast, which are fantastic. That's great. Uh, you know, if nothing else, you know, I mean, James Fisher and 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 Jer I mean, what we're talking about at the beginning of this thing about how Jeremy was talking about how it might not even be a connection between hypertrophy and strength, or 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 a weak connection at least. I mean, that just just accepting that possibility is moving the needle. You know, uh, and breaking paradigms and, and ways of thinking. And I just love that. I mean, uh, there's nothing, I mean, it's amazing what the kind of vitriol that, that I see by somebody just even by the mere fact of suggesting something like that towards each other. I mean, when you see these Facebook threads, which I always, I never get involved in them, but I do read them. I'm a voyeur in that respect. Um, I just can't imagine how, how people have all this time to retort like this. And so that's a whole other discussion. Uh, but, do, but I do see, I do see things changing, you know, I do. Uh, and, and I think thanks to you and thanks to, you know, thanks to a lot of people that are just, uh, sticking it out. This is not easy. You know, I've seen, I've seen some mess speaking of Facebook threads. I saw one former high intensity training guy jump onto a thread, just, you know, completely, excoriating us for for even choosing this as a, as a career because how much money can you make and these people right. you're just very sad you know, uh, you know like kind of putting down our vocations as as a career choice because in in this person's opinion we aren't going to make a lot of money we aren't going to get rich from this or we don't understand that these people that are hiring us just look at us as kind of you know caddies workout caddies you know and don't have much respect for us uh, I'm like, wow, I'm sorry you had that experience. I felt bad for that person. It certainly didn't shake my resolve for what I do for a living. Far from it. 
uh, it made me think about it a little bit. And, and, you know, not that I had to think too much about it because I'm very confident in what I do for a living. I have no second thoughts about what I chose as a career. And, uh, you know, getting rich is the least of it, you know, but I don't know. What was I saying? Where were we going with? (laughs) (laughs) No, no, I'm pleased you brought that up because, uh, it's, it's, I'm sure people are interested in your thoughts about maybe that comment. I I think I know the one you're referring to, but I I guess we were just talking about the way things are trending, uh, in here. I was, um, going to say to you, I don't know how much you pay attention to, uh, Europe and, um, you know, other hit organizations around the world. Um, you know, I think it's, it's really exciting because I talk to, you know, people like Patrick Mayer, who's the COO mm-hmm. of Kiza training. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have, I think that I, I would, I think they're the largest, um, high intensity based organization in the world now. And they have well over a hundred, uh, franchises. And I think it's like 40, uh, studios that they own. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they just use medics equipment and they've got their own R and D lab and they actually have manufactured their own machines, which sadly I, I do not believe are available to the, to the wider market, but they're unbelievable. Um, and, and they're still growing fast. And then you've got, um, the likes of Fit 20 who are also doing a franchise model, uh, in Europe at the moment. And they have 120 franchises, but they are more focused on, uh, one on one, 20 minute workouts, whereas Kiza is slightly different. It's more like uh, a monthly membership where you have some one on one at the beginning, but then you're kind of self supervised. Hopefully, I'm getting that right. So, slightly different models, but they're both doing really, really well. And they've, they've both um, spent a lot of time. Uh, really working on their systems and processes so that everything is repeatable and the operation at each studio uh, operates the way it should. Uh, and, and I just think, and, and I'm, I'm looking forward to doing more work with both of those organizations in the future because I think there is so much that we can all learn, even yourself, Adam, even though Inform is a, a great success, and also the smaller studios out there, those that have dreams and goals to be maybe like inform fitness one day, or, or maybe just want to have one studio, but just run it as a really nice business and, and enjoy that experience and enjoy owning that business and, and, and not having it, you know, run you, so to speak. Um, so I'm very optimistic mm-hmm. as you can tell. Um, and I feel very no, privileged yeah, to be I'm in a position to do this. Company. Yeah. I'm familiar yeah. with those two companies as well. And, uh, right. kudos to them. Yeah. They're doing a great job. I mean, I've spoken to, uh, some of the people over there at, right. at, at Kieser. Um, yeah, because I, want, I, I wanted to see if there's a way of getting the equipment, which you, of course, already said is not possible right now. But um, nonetheless, uh, they, they have the formula down for sure. Uh, it's great to see. Yeah, yeah so if, when you look at that, yeah. You know, and, and here in the United States, I mean, uh, Lou Carlson's doing a great job and, and, and yep. his credit, you know, he's acting so selflessly in a way. I mean, obviously it comes back to him, but you know, the fact that he's just putting out all this information and putting all the time into these conferences to get us all together to talk and he's trying to, uh, support all of our businesses. And, uh, it, it's, uh, I commend him for that. I commend him a lot for that because it's not easy. You know, you get all, you catch, I'm sure he catches a lot of flack <laughs> for Oh yeah, you know, tremendous what amount. He does and, and the amount of work. So, uh, so yeah, that's why I am positive, you know. And uh, yeah, we'll probably catch up to Europe eventually. I hope that would be great. Well, I mean, you've got obviously you've got the perfect workout and probably a handful of other organizations I've not mentioned. You know, Gains for Health and Fitness who are doing very mm-hmm. well. So yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I suspect it, it will certainly. Continue. On the other hand, on the other hand, you know, I. I talk to marketing people all the time and, you know, they're trying to pitch, pitch business to me and their clients. You know, I'm in New York City, so we have some of these big time marketing companies, you know, high end marketing companies that work with those major brands and they come to me and say, you can do this, you can become a major brand if you did this, this, and they're giving me all these ideas and thoughts on it. And, uh, you know, they're like, nobody knows about this. So we can talk about the Keezers and, and the Fit 20s and uh, Informed Fitnesses and, you know, Luke Carlson, Discover Strength. And uh, like you said, the perfect workout. Um, the thing is, nobody still knows about it, right? It's, 
Nobody talks about what we do the way they talk about Pilates. You know, it's not a noun. What we do is, isn't a noun yet. You know? That's right. And, you know, it, it's, yeah. it's, it's still an adjective. It's a type of strength training. You know, it's a description of a type of strength training. It, it's not a, like I said, a noun. It's not a name of a protocol, you know, uh, yet. So people aren't talking about what we do the way they talk about Pilates or, or Peloton. You know, which is has been frustrating. Maybe but it we'll get bored when it becomes really popular and won't want to do it anymore. I don't know. <laughs> it's just it's it's hard to just wrap us wrap this up into a little, you know, soundbite to explain what we do. It's it's more complicated than that. You know, um, it's it's not a lifestyle. It, 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 you know, everything else is a lifestyle. You know, exercise is about what you feel is good for you and what's right for you. Uh, until we get out of that mindset, I don't know, you know, how to wrap this up, you know, into a into a soundbite that makes people realize that this is what I should be doing. Although, again, we're, it's happening, you know, uh, but slowly but surely. Yeah, it, it's it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. I mean, given the marketing. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't even know what the answer is. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, again, people don't think. People think that I'm like, you know, anti-cardio. I hate, I hate that. People say, oh, you, you know, people almost come to me sometimes like they're at a confessional. You know, Adam, yeah, I, I've been I have to tell you something. I have to tell you something. What? I ran yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they, it's like I'm waiting for them to tell me they slept with my wife, and all they have to tell me is, that they, oh, you just ran yesterday. Oh, thank God, I thought you slept with my wife. Okay, I, I can handle this. This I can, you know. <laughs> It's like no big deal, man. No big deal. <laughs> Good, you ran. I mean, I'm you know you're anti cardio. No, I'm not anti cardio. I'm an, I'm a, I'm anti overtraining. I'm anti injury. You know, um, I, I look at exercise. I mean, I don't care if you exercise every day. I mean, loosely using the word exercise at this point, but you know, if you want to do your what I you know do your bout of high intensity exercise. Do your twenty minutes. You know. 4-4 four, four protocol, I don't care. Simple movements, compound movements. Just work your ass off. Do it safely. Work out really hard. And just do that a couple of times a week. And then whatever you do in between, you know, just do it in moderate things. So to me, it's not about cardio versus anaerobic. It's more about modulating intensity, right? You do a couple of really intense workouts a week. I don't really give a shit what tool you use, quite honestly. Uh, and you do some activity the rest of the week. Play a sport. Go jogging. Walk your dogs jog with your dogs, you know, see how you feel in the long run and make sure you're not, you know, and understand the risks you're taking based on the choices you're making. I mean, if you want to take up kickboxing and boxing, understand you're going to, you're going to probably hurt your elbow or your wrist or something if you're hitting the heavy bag. So I don't know. I mean, I can help somebody navigate what, what the best recreational pursuits to, to do in between their high intensity workouts. But that's, that's what I'm about. It's not that I'm anti anything other than anti getting hurt. You know, Dr. Tia and, and, and Dr. McGuff also, they talk about health span versus lifespan. You know, when Jeremy was talking about, you know, all cause mortality and whether it increased, you know, people that are strong, they live longer. Uh, that's all well and good. But I'm more concerned about, you know, what good is living the last 10 years of your life if you're kind of basically on a dialysis machine or you're constantly having to shoot yourself up sh shoot yourself up with insulin and you have to have hip replacement and knee surgeries and stents and all the interventions medical interventions just to keep you alive i mean to me that might improve your your length of life but what's what's your health span like what what's your quality of health you know that's more important to me so when when people are talking to me about exercise and lifestyle and what they should be doing, I distinct, you know, here we thank Ken Hutchins for this. You know, we talk about high intensity strength training as the exercise or some version of it as exercise versus recreation, which I'm all for. And recreation definitely has an exercise effect, right? But we're not really necessarily defining it as pure exercise, which is, I think, smart, you know, but people should be active. People should live their lives. I mean, one of my mottos and you know, taglines is, you know, exercise you need to live the life you want. And uh, I know people that really, they need, they need to do something every single day. You know, great, do it. You know, uh, just don't get hurt and let's not overtrain. And, you're, and we have no problems. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> for sure. 
Yeah, no, well said. Um, Adam, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, yeah. What's the best way for uh, listeners to find out more about you and what you're up to? Oh, well, we've talked about it. I guess one of the best things is my podcast and my website, you know, informfitness.com uh, is my website. I have blogs on there and all kinds of information. And then the podcast, of course, the Infor- Inform Fitness Podcast. Anywhere awesome. podcasts are found. <laughs> yeah, and I highly recommend it. I really enjoy it myself. And uh, assuming we do get this video to work, this podcast is brought to you by Medex Precision Fitness. I don't know if you can see oh, that. Okay. Um, cool. I figured if we can get this video thing to work, I might start wearing all these t-shirts that, that I get at conferences from friends of mine. So this is uh, Blair Wilson gave me this from Medex Precision Fitness in uh, nice Toronto. Guy. Nice met Rick for the first time. Really nice guy. Hi, Blair, if you're listening. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm going to start, as you may get this video to work, I'll start wearing a different t-shirt. And, uh, cause I just, I want to play more of a role and, and hopefully I've already done some of this to an extent in terms of promoting all of you guys. And, um, whether that's through just simply, uh, you know, people that are really into hit who travel, who, who might be local in your area and using, using your, your facility or whether they travel and use it when they travel. Um, or, or whether it's simply a case of my website gaining more traction and then the, the, the ranking of that helping everyone else's search engine ranking, you know, whatever, however it comes about. Um, and for everyone listening, to find the blog post for this episode, all the resources, obviously, are, as I said before, if you've got anything um, regarding uh, Dr. Ken Leisner, uh, please do send that to me at lawrence at highintensitybusiness.com. Um, and all of those resources will be at uh, highintensitybusiness.com forward slash Adam hyphen Zickerman. And for all episodes, please go to highintensitybusiness.com forward slash podcast. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. Discover how to achieve your health and fitness goals. Become a great personal trainer. And build a successful high-intensity training business. Check out highintensitybusiness.com. Highintensitybusiness.com. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly. And I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all of the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and get $500 off install when you place an order, please go to arxfit.com and mention HIB, that's High Intensity Business, in the How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $500 off install when you place an order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter HIB in the How Did You Hear About Us field.